What's going on everyone? Sergeant Argy right here. And today we're gonna be reacting to how Aurelian, I think that's how you pronounce his name, restored the Roman Empire part one. They only have two parts out right now, so this came out on May 2nd, which is only like which is pretty recent, so yeah. So I history of Mars haven't reacted to them in a, in a while. Since the Greece series, I believe. No, 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 the Roman Civil War series, I think. So we're back to them. Let's see how. Let's yeah. Let's see if you guys like this. So. Oh my gosh, twenty-seven minutes. I think I'm gonna have to split these up because. Listen, I've tried to do these whole videos. Like these whole long videos, and they've taken. One of them was over an hour. It was insane. So, and I, I, most people don't watch through all of that. So I'm gonna split this one into two parts. But yeah. Anyways, let's get right into this. No idea how real, how a real and even it. I don't even know who that is. So, you gonna find out, I guess. Whoa! New intro. You can like see the difference in quality since 2018 when they made the Grease series. It's a lot better. Wow. Amidst the rugged mountains on the dry, arid stretch of the Syrian steppe lay a wealthy city in a lush, fertile oasis. Adorned with sumptuous colonnaded streets, Tetrapylons, majestic temples, spacious agoras, theaters and baths, elaborate stone reliefs, monumental valley of the tombs, and administrative government buildings. The city of Palmyra was the jewel of the Middle East and a melting pot at the crossroads of culture, with Roman, Greek, Aramean, Arabian, and Persian influences all on display. Yeah, you would think. It's like right in the center of all those places. For over 30 years, this was the place that Queen Zenobia called home, where she wove together the obligations of kinship, patronage, and civic solidarity that Palmyra demanded of its notables. But in the scorching sunlight of the late summer of 272 AD, the Queen stood on the steps of the Temple of Baal with a troubled brow, her troops posted on the outskirts of the city. She firmly grasped her cloak in her hand as the smoke and fragrance of lingering incense filled the air and the sounds of solemn hymns sung to flutes, drums and tambourines reverberated in the majestic hall. With a camel at her side, carrying a shrine in which a sacred stone was shrouded... Why are there a bunch of... Troops there. Zenobia intoned prayers and made offerings of oil and wine, asking her god Baal for protection against those she perceived to be the invaders of her empire. However, the Emperor Aurelian deemed Zenobia's authority to be illegitimate and her bid for. Oh, okay, thought. Those troops are going to invade her or something. Okay, that's good. Power unsanctioned, and he came to Palmyra at the head of an army to settle the matter once and for all. Rude. This video is brought to you by our friends over at Curiosity Stream. As oh, thank you. Best account in the Mediterranean. Our city stream. And Curiosity Stream. You'd also be supporting our channel. Located in the semi-desert steppe of eastern Syria, Palmyra was a powerful city on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire. It derived the majority... Okay, so, wow, this is around at the height of the Roman Empire. As, in terms of, like, land that they had. I think they're gonna go and conquer this whole area for a while, and then let it go. Because they wanted to focus on internal problems, unless that already happened. 
So, right now, this is around the height of the Roman Empire. Just for context. The of its wealth from its location on the caravan trade routes of the Middle East. The city's merchants were renowned for their ability to secure safe passage of goods through treacherous country from one water source to another, especially during the dry season. Palmarine traders operated throughout the empire and, more crucially, played a major role in connecting Roman Syria to the middle Euphrates and from there the Persian Gulf. Since the times of Emperor Caracalla, Palmyra enjoyed the status of a colonia. However, in the middle decades of the 3rd century AD, when the Sassanids fought Rome for control of Armenia and Upper Mesopotamia, Palmyra attained a heightened political and strategic significance under the leadership of a prominent local aristocrat, Septimius Odonathus. The instability of warfare in the region threatened Palmyrene trade, and Rome expected the Palmyrenes to provide for their own security. This inadvertently helped this... What? That is not a good idea. Like, especially if we're a major city like that. They're just gonna let them... The heck? Why is it? I don't know why it does that. Hold on. My freaking headphones are disconnected. city to create a martial tradition of its own, and in the 240s and 250s, Odonathus used the reputation he had built up through his successful protection of the caravan routes from raiders and his position as commander of Palmyra's cavalry and dromedary archers to secure his dominance over the city and its civic council. By 251 AD, he and his eldest son, Herodian Hiron, were being honored in Palmyra as Resh, or leader, an unprecedented title among the Palmyrene elite. Nice, good job. The two continued to amass power, claiming consular rank by 258. And in 259, Odonathus campaigned against the Persians, sacking the city of Nihardia on the Euphrates. Odonathus's greatest opportunity then came in spring 260, when Emperor Valerian was captured by the Persians at the Battle oh, no. of Edessa. Valerian's son Gallienus was left as sole ruler of Rome, but the disaster of an emperor falling captive in battle sparked a crisis of loyalties. A cascade oh, of usurpers sprung up across the empire. In the unstable frontier regions, ambitious men seized power usually elected by the troops oh, or the local no. aristocracy, greatly contributing to the erosion of imperial authority and the decline of its internal structures. The populace suffered against incursions that were becoming increasingly difficult to check, most notably an Alemannic invasion of Italy that had already begun even before Valerian's capture and which Gallienus eventually crushed outside Milan, as well as Herulian and Gothic raids that saw the sacking of numerous cities in Greece. How was I not aware of this? I literally had to do an essay on the fall of the Roman Empire, and I did so much research. Yeah, I literally don't remember hearing about this at all. I saw it in my notes. Maybe I'll read them all. Back into the video. Because I swear I've never heard of this before. What the heck? Oops. Okay. Macedonia, Thrace, and Asia Minor, including Byzantium, Argos, Corinth, Sparta, Olympia, 
and Athens, as well as the destruction of one of the wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. In the west, General Posthumus, his Rhine army, and the governors loyal to him broke away from central authority, forging a Romano-Gallic regime with... Oh no! Okay. I should have probably touched on this earlier. But guys, this right now, this is like the end of the height of the Roman Empire. We're going to get into the, um, we're going to get into the crisis of the third uh, century. Remember earlier I said like that was their height in land or whatever, or they're about to take over like parts of Parthia or whatever, or the Sassanids or whatever. Um, that actually happened a while ago, I think. This is afterwards, where they take back that land. So, this is the end of Pax Romania as well, which is basically, of, um, which is basically whenever Rome was at peace for like a really long time and focused on internal problems instead of expanding everywhere. <sighs> yeah, a lot of civil wars are going to happen. A lot of economic stuff is going to happen. Barbarians are going to come. And, yeah. It's going to be really, really bad. And a lot of... And I mean a lot of extremely incompetent rulers are going to start to rule. <sighs> but, there was a period where Rome sort of rebounded, for at least temporarily, and became, like, pretty strong. So I think that's maybe what this is, Aurelian, but I don't remember for sure. So I guess we're going to find out, because, yeah. With Posthumus as emperor, further rocking an empire seemingly on the brink of disintegration. The Roman East was just as turbulent. Macrianus, one of the main fiscal officers of the empire, grabbed the opportunity using his influence as Valerian's treasurer to march on Rome. Planning to seize the capital, he took with him his eldest son, Macrianus Minor, intending to elevate him to the throne in the west. He left his younger son, Quietus, in charge of the eastern provinces, supported by the Praetorian prefect, Ballista, who was instrumental in propping up Macrianus's sons to the imperial throne. The momentum to usurp the throne gathered behind Macrianus, but his army was intercepted and defeated in Thrace, with both he and oh. his eldest son killed in the encounter. Oh no. Meanwhile, Quietus and Ballista lost control over the eastern provinces. In a calculated show of loyalty to Emperor Gallienus, Odenathus marched on Emesa and overthrew what remained of the usurper regime. It was a clever move. Gallienus recognized Odenathus's de facto authority, who was subsequently honored as Restorer of All the East, essentially becoming the Viceroy of Rome's most eastern provinces. This gave him authority over Roman governors and military forces in Syria and Upper Mesopotamia which Odenathus used to great effect to help push the Persians out of the eastern provinces, recapturing Roman fortresses of Carhai and Nisibis. In a brazen move showing his ambitions, he had declared himself King of Kings, a challenge to the imperial claims of Shahpur I of Persia. Oh, goodness. In 262 and 266, he twice invaded Persian-held Lower Mesopotamia, <laughs> reaching as far as the Persian capital, Tesaphon, wow. on both occasions. Oh my gosh, I didn't know the Persians had their capital so close. That is a bad idea. Like, like sure, you can get all the supplies to the front lines a lot easier and quicker, but it's literally right there, right next to the Romans. The Romans could easily go 
with the river and attack it, like, extremely easily. Like, uh, come on, they have a ton of mountains here. They should have put it behind the mountains and all these rivers. Like, wait, I'm pretty sure that city is Baghdad now. I Maybe. That's around where Baghdad is. Is that city Baghdad now? Which is the capital of Iraq? Uh, I don't know, let me know. I'm pretty sure it is. Patience. But was unable to take the city. Oh, come on. In on the Emperor's orders, he also campaigned against Gothic and Herulean raiders in Asia Minor. The Goths are really, really bad. By now, Odonathus had reached the apex of his power. However, members of Gallienus's court and Palmyra's elite were viewing his and his family's growing ambition with increasing concern. Although the details vary between the sources, it appears that in 267 or 268, Odonathus and his son Herodian were assassinated in a joint Gallienic Palmarine conspiracy. Oh no. The plan. So many people were assassinated back then. Oh my goodness. And backfired. Far from destroying the power of his dynasty, his. Like, that's arguably the reason why. The Romans couldn't conquer Persia. Because, like, all these people kept getting assassinated over and over again, who were supposed to be the ones leading Rome to invade Persia. So, and so then they had to, like, stop the invasion. Yeah, it's, it's really stupid. His widow Septimia Zenobia took matters into her, her own hands. She propped up her young son, Vabalathus, as the new restorer of the entire East, thereby treating her husband's viceroy position as hereditary, with herself taking the title of queen and ruling as regent. Wow. She wisely chose not to break ties with the imperial court, as she was not yet ready for war, but no one was left in doubt of the influence she possessed in the East. Gallienus did not accept that Odonathus's position as viceroy, which he himself granted in the first place, could be passed on to Zenobia's son. However, the establishment of Palmyra in the east, coupled with the failure to defeat the Gallic Empire in the west, seriously weakened Gallienus. The stability of the Roman Empire deteriorated further still when he too was assassinated in September 268. Different accounts of the incident are recorded, but they agree that senior officials wanted Gallienus dead. The new emperor Claudius managed to bring some stability. He stopped the Alemannic invasion of Raetia and Italy at Lake Benicus. He then marched east to meet a major Gothic invasion in the Balkans. At the Battle of Nisus, he achieved a major victory over the Barbarians. However, nice. the continuation of the war was less conclusive due to the outbreak of the plague, which affected... Oh, there were so many freaking plagues! Oh my goodness. Especially as Rome expanded eastward, they would meet with all these extra plagues and like all these other eastern tribes invading them. So many plagues came in. It was absolutely crazy. Let me just list you the ones, like, like, just the major ones. Um, at the, from the second century onward. The Antonine Plague. The Cyprion Plague, I don't know, I don't know how to pronounce most of the stuff. And I think there was the Justinian Plague. But, that, like, compared to, like, normal countries, they had so many plagues in just, like, 200 years. It is not even funny. The Romans, but savage the Goths even worse. Many Goths who survived were either admitted into the Roman legions or had lands assigned for them to cultivate. That's another thing. Like, they kept putting these Goths 
like all the all these barbarians into Romans is like they had so many people immigrate to Rome and they had so many people fill in the ranks but and they weren't that patriotic about Rome that meant that they didn't really have the same fighting spirit as Romans did so they were less effective um they weren't as familiar with the country and like the customs and stuff which damaged stability and whenever barbarian invaders came they didn't really mind as much so it was a whole big thing preoccupied with matters in the balkans claudius sent an expedition against zenobia under heraclianus a former praetorian prefect to reassert control over the east the details are unknown but the campaign was a disastrous failure for the central government oh, no. this was the point of no return recognizing weakness in the empire's central authority in the spring of 270 zenobia sent an expedition of her own to conquer the roman province of arabia Oh boy. This campaign, commanded by her general Zabdas, defeated the Cyrenian 3rd Legion, killed its commander, Whoa. and subdued its troops. Dang, okay. Later that nice. summer, the queen launched an invasion of Egypt with an army consisting Egypt. of Palmarines, Syrian legionnaires, mercenaries. I don't even want to stop. Like, we're already past the point, but I want to keep. And barbarians. Roman history is so fascinating. Like, besides World War II, the, Pol the Napoleonic Wars, the Cold War, and World War I, this is probably my most favorite point in history. But also, like, the, period the Bronze Age was also really interesting as well. Wow, they reached all the way to Egypt. That just shows how eroded the Roman Empire is at this point. It was a grueling hard. They got to Alexandria, no way! Hard. They conquered the Nile River Delta. Fort campaign, but Zenobia's forces successfully took Egypt. That is crazy. They more than doubled their land. Like, tripled their land in just a little bit of time. It's quite easily. Wow. Anyways, we're gonna do the next part tomorrow thank you all for watching and stay tuned this is pretty interesting hopefully all like this as much as i do but yeah goodbye Hello everyone if you enjoyed this video make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel and you know turn on the notification bell thingy and if you didn't then make sure to leave a uh, thumbs down but yeah that would be greatly appreciated and while you're at it, go ahead and watch my other videos. They're probably just as good, and if not better, than this one right now. Except for my oldest videos. Don't watch those. And, you know, subscribe to these people down here, my fellow sergeants. They're other YouTubers that I either know or I have in high regards. Yeah, even my cat agrees. So, thank you for watching, and have a great day.